Hi everyone, welcome. My name is Abigail Oran um, and I'm here today without Ada Barlat. Ada and I are the co-creators of Devon Think for Historians, a set of online courses that walks you through the key features of Devon Think, uh, as well as shares tips, tricks, and scripts to help you save time when using this powerful database software for historical research. Um, before we continue, I um, just, ask you to ignore the little home improvement project happening behind me. Um, I had to set everything up this way um, today because I have my laptop, my monitor, we have a lot going on because we're really going to get into the topic of today's video, which is the schema I am using for the DOTS Devon Think database. <laughs> so uh, first, uh, Thank you to everyone who uh, liked and left comments on the Dots Devon Thing database introductory video. I found it encouraging and fulfilling to see all of the engagement. So thank you again. Um, as I mentioned, today we'll be talking about schema. Uh, schema is the group hierarchy I've implemented in my database. Um, in computer hard drive terms, we talk about folders, uh, but in Devon Think nomenclature, these are called groups. So my schema has evolved with the project. I somehow, <laughs> I'm so impressed with past me because I somehow had the foresight uh, to create a screenshot recording last year when I was first creating the Dots Devon Think database. Uh, so I actually have some footage to share with you all um, of the very first steps of creating groups and adding some content into the database. So I'll show you, you know, uh, I'll show you that. And then after we'll take a look at the database in its current form. And then finally, it is going to join me. We're going to talk about my current schema and um, she's going to share her insights as someone who's an expert on processes and efficiency. So before I roll the screen recording footage from when I created the database, some context. First, I created the database the day before going to Syracuse University's archive, um, where they have a collection of um, Mark Dotz's papers. You'll see me setting up the database using a template that comes with the Devon Think for Historians super user course. You'll see some other templates that also come with the course as well, um, like our super annotation template. And finally, to keep the video short, I did chop. <laughs> I took out a lot of the clicking around between my browser and Devon Think. So this is not a tutorial. It's not a substitute for a tutorial. It's, it is just a quick and dirty overview of um, the, the very beginning of the database. Um, but so it gives you some insight into the setup process. Okay, let's roll that tape.
So that's the seed from whence the dots database has grown. Let's see what it's looking like today. So I'm gonna just keep this camera rolling and I am um, going to start a screenshot recording um, going in my um, computer. And so hopefully we'll be able to like have me talking in the corner as you see me clicking around. Let's see if it works. So as you can see, there are many more groups than there used to be. Um, the annotations, uh, annotations group is still here. The web group is still here. And the archives group is technically still here. I've just embedded it within, or nested it, I should say, within uh, a larger archives group. So now it's a subgroup, but you can see that all of the boxes are still here. I've just added um, the Archives of American Art. I have not been able to go do research there yet, um, but there are some collections I wanna look at. So I've just been putting my finding aids in here um, and the uh, Visitor Information Center for, where, for when I am ready to head over there. Okay. The most notable change in uh, the in what you're seeing is that my schema has really shifted. So initially I was following what Ada and I call the mirroring the archive data um, schema in the Devon Think for Historians starting up course. Basically what the what mirroring the archive means is that you're organizing documents um, and creating groups uh, according to their location or origin, like library, archive, web. That's what I did for my dissertation. It worked really well for me because I heavily relied on a few very large manuscript collections and a handful of archives. And because it worked so well for me, I thought, okay, that's where I'll start with this project. But I've increasingly been moving towards a thematic schema. I was finding that because I have not yet done a lot of archival work, most of the documents I have collected so far have been from the web, particularly ancestry.com and newspapers.com, though that the you know that's there are many other places on the web I have also drawn um, documents from. But I was finding that everything was ending up in either the genealogy folder or the web folder. And they became huge and unwieldy and it was really difficult and inefficient to find the documents I was looking for when I needed to use them. So what I started to do was to create thematic or topical groups. Um, you can see that now my web folder is a really manageable size um, and I am I'm not really struggling uh, to find what I need in it. And um, that's because I've dragged so many documents that were originally in the web folder into some of these topical folders that I will show you. Also, you may notice that there is no file naming convention happening here. Um, I have uh, been kind of landing on a file name convention that I want to make uniform throughout the database, um, but I'm still working through it slowly. Um, so maybe we can talk about that in a future video. Um, and I should also say that you know, as I continue to do research, I'm sure that some more of these documents in the web folder will eventually be moved into new topical groups that I create. So I would say that at this point, my schema is a bit of a hybrid between mirroring the archive and the thematic schema. Um, so the, the thematic schema is really like historical actors. And then I also have a galleries and museums group. So maybe we could call that like a people and places theme. Um, but I, you know, I still have these um, origin or location based 
um, groups like we already looked at archives and web, um, but I also have a secondary literature group. Um, currently, I don't have subgroups here. I may create some in the future, and that could either be like journals, uh, sorry, journal articles, um, book chapters, dissertations and theses, or I could go in a more thematic direction and have like communism and abstract expressionism or whatever else um, I, I've accumulated a, a critical mass of um, documents relating to that topic. So let's start looking at the historical actors folders beginning with dots. So, so far I have just two subgroups in here. The first is every example of paintings and etchings that I've been able to find on the web, as well as, um, you know, my family, my extended family has um, many of Dots' work spread, you know, throughout the family. So I've been having relatives send photographs of their pieces. So I've just been dumping that all into this group. And I'll probably continue finding and dumping stuff into this group. And then the genealogy is a lot of what you saw in that um, earlier screen recording, you know, just going on ancestry and pulling all of the vital records and censuses. Um, and that, so that folder, I just ended up moving into the, as a, into making it a subfolder and putting it within the dots folder. Okay. So, um, I also have a genealogy subgroup in Aaron Goodelman's group. Um, here you can see I have two documents that are highlighted in red. They're both census records. Um, these are, the red is an indication that these are replicants, meaning that I have this document in multiple different folders. Um, so in this case, I also have it in Harry and Israel Goodelman's folders. Um, if I make a change to either of these documents, it'll be reflected in all of those groups. So that's um, a really nice feature in Devon Think. In addition to the genealogy subgroup, I have an illustrations and graphic design subgroup. That's just examples of books um, that um, Aaron Goodelman worked on over the years. Um, I've created a sculptures group that is, you know, it, there's only one thing in it right now. I will continue adding as I grab more examples of his work. I've just started this. And then um, Aaron Goodelman also taught a lot. And so I was finding documents uh, related to his students and I started collecting them into a subfolder. And the rest is currently just a, a grab bag of documents, like similar to the web folder. I, um, I anticipate that as I acquire more and more documents and, and start putting them into this group, I will begin to create additional subgroups that um, aggregate documents uh, on different topics. The Barkins group is another mishmash of um, documents, particularly genealogical documents related to my maternal grandfather's family. Harry Goodelman, um, as you can see here, are the replicants again. Um, this is materials related to Harry and Israel Goodelman's is similarly just, you know, a couple of documents right now. Um, I'm just filing whatever I find related to them into these subgroups and, you know, I'm repeating myself, but as I get more, I'll create more subgroups. Now, Leon Goodelman is the son of Harry, or was the son of Harry and Rosie Goodelman. Um, I do have a subgroup in here uh, about Lear Publishers. Um, which was a very leftist press, and I kind of fell into a research rabbit hole for a few days, um, like a few days. <laughs> and 
uh, this is what I was able to find. And so I organized it together into a subgroup to make it easy to just look at those particular materials. Um, and the rest is a grab bag similar to the others. Now, finally, let's look at galleries and museums. So I'm creating subgroups for all of the galleries or gallerists who were important and influential to the careers of Mark Dotz and Aaron Goodelman. I've, create, I've also created a folder with all of the clippings, um, newspaper clippings I could find uh, about Dotz's um, exhibits and shows um, so that I could kind of create a comprehensive timeline of his artistic output. I mean, I plan to do the same for Aaron Goodelman. I just haven't had a chance to do so yet. So I will have an, an additional sub, subfolder then that's called Aaron Goodelman Exhibit Clippings. And then these are examples of gallerists and galleries that were um, interesting to me because of their relationship to the careers of, of Dots and Aaron Goodelman and you know, if I so choose, I can go and um, do some archival work or additional research on them in the future. So that is the Dots Devon Think database to date. <laughs> if you have any questions, please drop them into the comments and I'll try to answer them when I have a chance. So uh, at this point, um, I'm going to stop recording and uh, I think tomorrow uh, Ada and I are gonna get together. I'm gonna send her all of this footage for her to watch um, so that she can ask me any questions she has about all of this. Um, and I am guessing that she'll have some smart advice for me um, that might benefit you as well. So see you tomorrow. Okay. Yay. Well, we did a little bit of time traveling and it's now tomorrow or the day after. <laughs> um, and we're going to chat about your amazing database. I'm so excited. Um, first, I loved, love, love, love the tour. Hopefully everyone else enjoyed it. And, um, you know, I, as I was watching you, your past you, I guess, not just from a few days ago, but from last year, <laughs> um, go through uh, the database. I thought that was amazing and, and fascinating, fun. And then also I love the music you selected. I was like grooving along, which was super fun. <laughs> I was like, oh, who knew research could be so dancey? It was really awesome. So <laughs> I was, thank you for that. I think it's a really cool look at an active project uh, and a project that's a work in process because I, I think finding that work in process can be so it can be daunting to get started. And then when you're in the middle of it, it can feel like, oh my gosh, I have to change. And that can feel horrible, confusing, overwhelming, all sorts of uh, emotions. Um, so I think it's great that you you gave everyone some insight as to your transition. And that's actually where I wanted to start um, is, is making sure I make that point strongly. It, as, I was, you were, as I was watching the video, I was taking all these notes and that was the one I was like, oh, exclamation point, exclamation point, that you can change. Um, yeah. Starting is the important part and then uh, changing uh, is totally possible. And I loved, 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 loved it. I wanted everyone to hopefully capture the point that you said for the, the kind of the trigger for why you realized you needed to change, which was um, you found it difficult to find the documents you were looking for when you went looking for them. So I was like, because <laughs> sometimes even for the course, so in addition to the course, sometimes we offer one-on-one -on -one sessions with people to get feedback on their schema. And, and sometimes they have lots of questions about, you know, what's the right thing to do? How do I get started? And I find it that we, we, we find ourselves saying, get started, you can always change. And the trigger point for that change is when you can't find what you're looking for. So um, I just said a lot, but any initial thoughts? You're doing a lot of head nodding. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I that's exactly right. Is um, your project leads you mm -hmm. that by being too rigid or prescriptive about organization, you can actually uh, obfuscate rather than clarify Ooh, and to 
yeah and you have to go with the flow sometimes you know and just yeah and and just I like you know it's a good problem to have when you find a lot of data yeah. right when yeah. you uh when you realize that you have a large trove of documents to use for your research that's a wonderful wonderful thing what a good problem to have right. but it does require flexibility in how you organize and um so that's what I had to do. I I just it was so clear to me that at this phase of this project, if I kept everything in that web folder, I was I, I was going to be so reliant on other forms of filtering like tags or which are wonderful and it's everyone fine. should be using other forms of filtering, but it's not like I had that many documents, you know, it's just that they were all in one group. Yeah, yeah. 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 I love that. I think there's two, two really interesting points from that. One is that there are many different ways in Devon Think to find your documents and organize them and tag them and label them and all sorts of things there and, and put them in these group or groups or folders. So that's really cool. Um, and then the other part is that you started with something and then as you were looking, you were like, oh, what do I need next? And then you're like, okay, I'll use this. And then you're in this sort of hybrid place now. And you're okay with that, hopefully. <laughs> and who knows what may happen as you discover some more documents. So I love when you said you're letting the documents lead you uh, along. I think that that is, that is really, really cool. Um, so you in the, in the video, you describe that you, your last like one of your big projects, your dissertation, a big, very big project. Um, you started by mirroring the archive. That's one of the schemas that we discussed in the course. And then how did you know that this um, topical area was what you wanted to go to next? That's a good question. I, I think because I was starting with genealogical research and the way in which those database source databases are organized, like family search, like ancestry, I started thinking about these historical actors as sort of um groups. Yeah. Uh, themselves. I will tell you what I don't love about this schema, okay. or at least as I currently have it organized. Um, and it's fixable, but there are no women in this. Oh. Um, <laughs> I, that was so, not going. I was like, no, but it's something I wanted to address. So yeah. I, um, I think, you know, our biases are reflected in the ways in which we organize our research. And I think um, while I don't think I have as strong of a gender bias, uh, at, I think the, the um, what the database reflects is less my gender bias than the bias of the archives themselves mm -hmm. and, what, and the documents that are saved. But I, I, I bear some culpability because I haven't gone and done all of the work to go and and ferret out all of the uh, records that I can about um, Lessie and Rosie and um, Sarah Goodelman, who was married to Aaron. Um, I don't even know the name of Israel Goodelman's wife off the top of my head. So there are a lot of women in, in this story, um, women who, frankly, these men depended on for their careers because of the labor they provided. And so, um, yeah, so I, I just kind of wanted to address that. Yeah. Um, so I'm hoping that, I, I mean, I obviously can add more groups. Right. Um, but I, I do think when you sort of lift up historical actors, what happens is that you're sort of creating 
um, an inherent like hierarchy or um, ranking, I guess, of of the importance of various people in the past. That's interesting. That's interesting. What, what was coming to my mind, I think though that's so, so cool, that observation that you made. What was coming to my mind as you were talking was how cool is it that your decision or really your, your shifting and how you organize the groups? Because if you had like archive and web, you, this, this whole realization would have never, it would have never come into being um, or it might have, but maybe be through tags or something else, but not as easily. Um, so how interesting was it that you could, through simply the choices you made in the groups, quickly right. identify two things. Now I'm thinking about it, the, the gender issue that we were talking about now, but even the web issue that you mentioned in the video, like it was became very apparent to you quite quickly because the web folder was getting so large, there was a problem, you resolved the problem. And then, oh, here's another situation that needs resolving and another direction that you can take your research. So that's really cool. Yeah, I mean, to that point, it's, um, it's a journey. Yeah, it's <laughs> um, a work in process. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The other thing that I thought was really interesting, and I love your thoughts on this, it almost was like the initial web folder that you had ended up being almost like an inbox. <laughs> so like Devin Think has the inbox <laughs> and you were like creating this massive, massive, massive web folder. But then almost, as you was watching, I was like, oh, she kind of made this second inbox. <laughs> what are your thoughts? You <laughs> That was a big reaction. <laughs> so when I was... Um, chopping up the footage from last year. <laughs> I chopped out a lot of footage of my global inbox in Devon Think because it is chaotic. <laughs> now, every database has its own inbox. So there's the Devon Think global inbox. So if you have no databases open, everything goes into the global inbox, um, but you can assign things to like your dots inbox or your business inbox or whatever your multiple databases are. Um, my inboxes always become chaotic messes. And so I avoid them. So <laughs> I, you are absolutely right. That there is um, an inbox is necessary. <laughs> it has a really important function and I've sort of just kicked <laughs> like I, every time an inbox gets chaotic, I find a way to just like create a spot like that. Um, the the um, piece of you that's been incepted into me says that I should go and just clean out my inboxes <laughs> and it will take five minutes, <laughs> but it's not important and I never go do it. And there, it's okay for them sitting there. So it's totally <laughs> fine. And clearly you found another way, which is the web folder. Like everything will get where it needs to get uh, in, in the right time. And maybe over some holiday or some time when you're like, oh, I just want to sit and clean out my inbox. That moment <laughs> might come, or maybe not. <laughs> From your mouth to God's ears. <laughs> We'll see. We'll see. Um, that is so funny. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting, but it's, Cool to think, and one of the things I like most about Dev and Think is that it is so flexible, but I think that can be, you know, it can be a blessing and a curse at the same time. But I love that you could take, you know, a whole bunch of documents and throw them in a group, or you could have put them all in the web tag, or you could have added some sort of label and processed it its own way. But I think, and I hope the, I think the big message that I would like to come across in this video is making your database reflect your mind is really yeah. quite amazing because then it can really support you. So if you like sort of the hierarchical structure of a visual sort of opening and the drop downs and all that great stuff of seeing the documents in groups or folders, then go that way. If you like tags and maybe making um, smart groups or other things then go that way. So whichever way that it works in your mind, um, it's, you know, fairly possible. Like there are ways to make it visual with color. There are ways to like all sorts of different things um, that you can do and, and uh, ways you can personalize how your Devon Think looks as well. Um, your Devon yeah. uh, software on your, on your computer. So I think there's, it's a huge opportunity for people to 
explore with the software um, and, and see what might work for them. Um, I think that's a great point. I mean, um, our, our brains all work very differently. Um, the way that we recall information is yeah. very different. I do tend to have very visual recall. And so I like creating a breadcrumb, <laughs> like yeah. breadcrumb trail for myself with subgroups yeah. because I remember I click here, I click here, I click here. This is where this thing will be. Um, if there is not sort of a path, a file path, if you will, I struggle right. to know where something is. Yeah. Um, like if it were all just to be in one, you know, giant group with different colors that I would struggle with that. But I also know people, um, I had this professor in college, you walked into his office and it was piles on every surface, piles and piles of books and papers. And he knew where everything was. Yeah. And to me, you know, I was just, like, oh, <laughs> I can't deal with this. Um, yeah. I mean, he would have to like, for you to sit down you have to pick up whatever pile was on his chair, you know, and move it. Um, and you can do that in Devon Think if you, you want can. to create, you, you, you know, a, a giant office of piles. However you want, however you want. For me, I love naming conventions. So that's what's gonna be my next question because I personally, the way I organize things is sort of by the document name. And then I search for things. I love you know, typing into a search box and finding things that way. You mentioned in the video, so that's a difference between us. Um, yes. No, neither is good or bad. It's just an option. You mentioned in the video that you were going to go back and do a naming convention. I, I did see you in the very fast version, like rename something. So I, so if you could touch on that and then also what your vision is for the naming convention or what you would like to do moving forward. Sure. So um, when you saw me renaming, oftentimes when you download particularly PDFs from the web, they have just names that are jumbles of characters or um, there's so much, um, they, they use like um, underscores instead of spaces. That drives me crazy. So I often will clean up or rename files. Um, now, when I am in the flow state of research and I just <laughs> want to get stuff into the database, Okay. I often just put it in and put the most basic name. Okay. Possible. Oftentimes if it's like an article, I just, it's the title. <laughs> if it's a document. It's just some kind of basic description of what it is. I'm much more careful about the metadata. Like I, I always try to make sure that I have, um, if Devin thinks Clipper didn't put in a URL to its origin, I'll go grab it and put it in. Um, but for the name, I can always change that. Right. I um I think I'll do a video, a separate video about the naming convention I'm going with because I think what I'm going with will involve a dating system um, that I we've sort of talked about with um you mentioned like we sometimes do consultations yeah. and we've sort of talked through this method in consultations in the past. So yes. I think I'll, I'll um, do a video kind of explaining it. Um, Fun. But um, yeah, I think ultimately it's easier to go back and rename stuff. Like you said, in a moment where, yeah. you know, you have only the brain space for a tedium, a tedious task like that, yeah. um, than it is to like actually do be in the research flow state and just be gathering your materials. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Come back and rename. Well, I think that that is a really cool transition to my next question, which was about the smash and grab checklist mm. that you open to sort of start that process. So there are there. Are, kind of two templates we made in that that are in the super user um, guide, but I'm curious why you chose Smash and Grab. Maybe that is 
related to how you approach research and this flow state. So yeah, give us some, some insight. I mean, I had one day <laughs> to visit the archive. Um, I knew there was no way I was going to get through the whole collection in one day. I wanted to be as prepared as possible going in to, I didn't want to waste any time in the archive creating groups for, you know, different boxes and folders and things like that. I wanted to be able to go in open boxes and start looking and assessing what was there, what was important to me, right. um, what I might want to come back and look at. Um, and so I, whereas the um, low and slow, you know, is for, okay, you're spending several weeks at an archive. Maybe you have a fellowship. Maybe it's the summer. Oh, summer, <laughs> summer research. Yeah. Um, and in that case, for every document you put in your database, take the time then to put in all of your citation information to make sure that all of your tags go on, to make yeah. sure that everything is as done as possible in the moment you're adding the document. Yeah. For a quick trip like this, just get take the photo, get it into your database. You can come back later. And the checklist walks you through how to come back later right. and get all of that information in. So I just like structure. I like a checklist. Um, They're always fun and handy. Helpful. So, yeah, and you have a lot on your mind, I think, going into the archive. And and so what I like about the checklist that we have and and splitting it up is you know, you can focus when you're at home before you leave, organize, pre-organizing as well as you can, because obviously we spoke earlier about changing if you need. And then mm -hmm. when you're there, you can focus really on just getting things in to the database. Um, you know, like from a from like an engineering perspective, shifting tasks takes a lot of time and energy and effort, and it can make you more tired. So being able to do one type of task over and over again, and then another type of task over and over again in the archive will make you more productive overall, as opposed to like going back and forth and doing that mental work of, of shifting back and forth, which exactly. is really cool. Awesome. So we've talked a lot about so far in this, um, in this uh, conversation and, and about sort of getting things into the database. Sometimes we refer to that as inputting. We talked about that in the course and I think in other videos too. What do you think you're going to output on the other end? Have you thought about what's coming out? Do you have a vision? Is that vision shifting? Has it influenced or is it influencing your decisions on groups and subgroups, maybe tags or labels, smart groups, anything like that? No, you don't know. So now you're in the collection. Phase. I'm like, so I'm like, so wary to. <laughs> oh, okay. You, you, you to the ball. Okay. Sorry. I, it's she, did not prepare, she did not prepare any of these questions in advance. So <laughs> putting you on the spot. Yeah. I, I, I mean, the core of your question is, have I made decisions about the organization of the database on the basis of what I'm hoping to produce? Yeah. And the answer is no. I'm letting the documents themselves lead me at this point rather than a vision of what the final output might be. Excellent, excellent. And so you're taking that ride and you'll you'll see where it goes. If it goes. <laughs> it will go. It will go. I think it's already amazing. I I hopefully everyone else enjoys it. I know I'm really enjoying seeing the process from that background video and working your way forward and now we, we saw that we can actually create the database <laughs> and so I think it'll be fun to see how the process goes and what you decide to create I, I as I was watching I, I, I had all sorts of little ideas I'm like oh I wonder if she'll do this oh I wonder if she'll do that so we'll see what happens um let me just look through all the notes I took while we were while you were while I was watching rather um, we didn't talk about replicants at all. 
that was my that was my I think that's my last question. So you mentioned replicants, and um, I'm just curious why you like them. If you could give a little bit of like why use them and why you kind of gave an insight of what they are. Same yeah. thing in multiple places, but why do you really like them? Um, actually, this maybe does tie back a little bit to your prior question. Ooh, so. Great. In thinking about how I will tell this story, I know I will have to write, you know, some historical context or, or like the origins or the just the life stories of all of these historical actors at some point. So I am thinking ahead of like, okay, well, when I go to write um, about Aaron Goodelman's immigration story, about his siblings, about where they lived when they arrived in New York. I want to be able to just have his folder open with all of the vital records related to him. Yeah. And the same for his brothers, Harry and Israel. Um, I don't want to have to be writing about Aaron and then toggle back to Harry because I know that's where I put the 1910 census for the Goodelman family. Right. It can be in both places. It can be totally fine. So yeah. that's that's the logic there is um if you think that you're going to be using a document in conjunction with a set of with sorry in conjunction with two different sets of other documents, you can have it in both places and you will not have to move from group to group but rather staying within a group just move from document to document yes i love that and that ties to this to the outputting question that we got to of like how do you take all this information that you gathered and organized and maybe reorganized maybe once or twice um and create something fabulous with it and so i think that that's fantastic that you're thinking about maybe the core things that you know you're going to have to write no matter where the story goes you know you're going to write about um the, their immigration story and their family structure and different things about the siblings so you know that you want certain bits of information as you talk about each one I think that's really cool and to save your time I'm sure future you will thank past you <laughs> or having all of the documents in one spot. So you can go from document to document and not group to group when writing. I think that that's great. Another, I think, hopefully interesting tip for everyone. Um, an interesting way to balance how you structure your database now so that you can save time writing later. Right. Hey, okay. awesome. Well, that was my last question. I'm happy I went through my list and, and made sure I asked them all. Do you have any other last thoughts before we end the video? Uh, no, I guess I should say that I think the next video I do will either be on naming conventions or on labels. Yes. And um, I, yeah, if folks have questions, feel free to leave them in the comments and, you know, we'll try to respond um, as you know, yeah. as best we can. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think also I'll put out um, for some feedback on this format. I know um, previously before our break, um, we were making different kinds of videos. This one is a bit on the longer side, I think for us. So do you like it? Do you not like it? Let us know what you think um, and we'll keep making videos. So I guess until the next time. Bye everyone.